Hey, everybody. Welcome to Thankful Thursday, week number 122. Wow. Believe it or not. Yes, indeed. And you will be happy to know that we did not call each other on getting a red colored shirt uh, <laughs> before we started today's webinar. But Jim rolls in. He's got a burgundy shirt. Jack's got a burgundy shirt. I've got kind of a rust colored shirt. So anyway, um, oh, uh, Russell, <laughs> you're coming in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm, I'm muting you. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's funny. So we do have a guest coming in two weeks. Russell Hughes will be on. We're going to talk about recession proofing moves that you can do with a real from a real estate perspective so uh he get he's the early bird he gets the warm but he did not get the uh the, the memo on what color t-shirt or shirt to be wearing so we're going to keep him <laughs> off off camera today um but anyway russell's good to have you so here's the deal i'm wearing a thankful t-shirt today because i'm thankful for so many things first of all joe farrell who's probably on here already uh he is a hey, friend Joe. and he's a client and he's actually on the current edition of the Anything But Typical podcast that we dropped yesterday. Very interesting story. If, you have, if you're interested in multi-generation dynamics of running a business, like he's got a really interesting story. Roddy Player a couple of weeks ago, the same way. I'm also thankful because Jack Santaniello is back with us. Uh, we'll have to hear about the pink Jeep tour that he had with his family. Um, and Adam Boatsman is investing in his family with a marriage retreat with his wife. So they're in the mountains. I'm so thankful that he's doing that. That's a very cool thing. And then we get to have Jim Dunn with us today. I'm thankful for Jim Dunn because he has been BGW's coach for eight years. I have seen and he owns a Sandler franchise that we actually bought his practice. He's now part of the BGW team, but he is with Sandler Training. And um, he is so effective, and I've learned so much from him. And I know our team, filled with a bunch of CPAs who are not necessarily known as being salespeople, they've learned and grown tremendously under him. So we know that recessionary fears, whether we're in it or not, um, those things fuel the need for more sales, especially. And so that's why we've got Jim on here today. So uh, before we go any further, oh, and by the way, for those who wait till the end, Jack Santaniello, he, he is feeling feisty today because he has got a couple free giveaways for those who hang to the end. And I don't know if that means he's going to subject us to bad dad jokes or what. I don't know. I can't promise that. So that's the disclaimer, but hang to the end. And we also uh, have three poll questions. Those are going to be fun today. Um, oh, chat is disabled. Oh, thank you, Joe. I'm going to see what in the world has happened to our chat. I'm going to go into our uh, thing, but while I do that, Jack, take it away, uh, because Joe Manchin has thrown a, a little uh, spice into the punch bowl, and uh, we'll talk more about that probably next week, but I know you've got an update, and give us an update on the Jeep, uh, pink Jeep tour. Yeah, sure. So um, glad to be back. Uh, it was a great time, great opportunity, very blessed to do the things that we did. Uh, so we did two pink Jeep tours. Um, Flew in a helicopter over the Grand Canyon, went rafting, Horseshoe Bend, went up to Moab and stood um, underneath the Delicate Arch. And so did and, and all kinds of things in between. Oh, and then maybe this was divine intervention, but we were supposed to have a minivan. They gave us an off-road forerunner and we did take it off-roading. Uh, and in fact, I was very scared. I mean, I um, usually don't panic, but we hit some soft stand in... Um, Lake Powell, and uh, I thought, and in all the locals, so I found a place that was really locals, and so went tearing through there and got it stuck. I thought, and just kind of inched my way backwards in four wheel low, and so <laughs> I learned a lot, um, or refreshed my recollection about geometry and physics and everything else, and got us out. Um, so all was good there. 
Uh, it's a good thing you paid attention during those classes, Jack. Yeah, you know, they say that, it, you know, is it really going to help you in life down the road? Well, it took several decades, but yes. So yes, yes, kids, it does. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then I did, you mentioned Joe, and I know Joe and Sean, um, very important fact was that Sean played baseball at UNC, Chapel Hill. So he's fellow Tar Heel. Um, so uh, as far as getting into some of the, the fun stuff of politics over the past week. So I'm, um, like I said, I normally don't like to read stuff, but I mean, this, what I found is very concise as to what kind of happened over the past couple of days. They're still working through a lot of this. And I think that we, we will know more as the days come. So that's why I think it's, it's appropriate that we have a more detailed conversation of what is in and what is not in maybe next week because they're still, they're still making the sausage essentially on this. So, um, so Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin on Wednesday said they had struck the climate, health and tax, tax package deal weeks after Manchin seemingly had scuttled any chance of an agreement because of his worries over inflation. The new package is a fraction of the more than three trillion deal once envisioned by liberal Democrats, but it still could give the party a big win ahead of midterm elections where House and Senate majorities are on the line. The deal will be a part of the budget reconciliation package that Senate Democrats plan to bring to the floor next week and pass on party line vote, circumventing a Republican filibuster under special Senate rules. The timing of Manchin and Schumer's announcement raised eyebrows for a few reasons, because a few hours earlier, the Federal Reserve voted to increase the central bank's baseline interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point in an effort to slow inflation. So you have one governmental organization kind of putting pressure on the other to get something done where it seemingly there was an impasse. So it's interesting how all that works, but you know, as, um, as was said, we'll talk about it more, I think, next week when we really know more because there'd be a lot of speculation as to what really is going to go into that final package that gets put onto um, the, the Congress floor. Yep, that's good, Jack. Um, I'm glad that you paid attention during physics class. That was actually my favorite uh, of all the science classes. <laughs> it seemed mo most practical. Um, so that, that's good. And we're glad that you didn't roll that baby and have to buy a, a you know broken down pink Jeep. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> you pay a, a lot for one that has a lot of miles on it, I'm sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, there was a guy who, one of the guides, so you can get guides that do this and i got to a point where i we parked and then walked a half a mile to go and there's actually dinosaur prints up there so they say so we went to wow. where the dinosaur prints are and um but i watched other these other trucks come from the other direction and then one guy i mean he was three wheels and the fourth wheel was way in the air like maybe a foot or more in the air and he stopped and he looked back and he smiled and he's like did you see that i'm like yes i did and, and he was waiting for me to go down the same route i'm like nope put it apart and we walked so uh, anyway it, it's a fun trip and very again very fortunate and blessed to have done it with my kids it's what my daughter wanted to do for uh post-graduation and so that's what we did and we hadn't been so uh, but yeah glad to be back though um yeah, going away for a week, as anyone knows, uh, for a period of time, um, things add up and pile up at the end, if you can truly unplug, which I didn't, but even then, it's it's difficult, so. That's that's good. Yeah, that guy wants to have on his tombstone, hold my beer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, he had a big smile on his face, but he knew what oh he was doing. What well, wasn't yeah. his truck Watch anyway. this. <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right. Well, Jim Dunn. So anybody, you guys know the drill. Uh, now that we've got the chat feature um, working again, I don't know why it keeps reverting back. I, I, for the life of me, I don't know. So Joe, thanks for keeping us honest and thanks for being a great guest on the anything but typical podcast. We really appreciate that. You did a great job. Um, so Jim Dunn, yes, sir. I know that uh, you have been through a couple recessions you have seen some trends and uh, you have seen what works and what doesn't work. And so I'm going to take and turn this thing over to you. Anybody that has questions, hit us up in the chat or the Q&A. 
You can harass us still. Be easy on Jim, though. We want him to come back. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. So, you can be um, the tough prospect. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So um, take it away, Jim. Well, first of all, thank you, Gary. I appreciate that, uh, you and Jack. And it is an honor to be part of the BGW team. And, and uh, so I'm looking at some names. Joe Farrell. Uh, Joe, uh, you and Sean, I hope that, uh, that both of you are, uh, are doing great. And so thanks, everybody, for being a part. So let me start out with this. Uh, yes, I have been, uh, Gary, through uh, actually, you know, whatever they called 2008, the Great Recession. I have been at least through four swings, 30 years as a, uh, as a Sandler coach. When I got in in 92, there was one. Uh, with George Bush Sr. Uh, being uh, president uh, at the time. And, you know, it's just all part of the business cycle. So I want to start off with this rule right here. And this is really a, a, a great insight. Find out what your competition is doing and do something different. I think that really right there is the spirit of, uh, of all of this. Because the other part of any kind of a, of a recession is don't get defensive. Now, I want to give everybody some things, some takeaways here uh, today. Now, uh, a lot of us get real defensive about our pricing. Terrible strategy to lower your pricing. Uh, what I would like to do, I'll go to the questions that I'd asked in, in the poll, but I really want to start off with those things right there is to find out what your competition is do and do something different. And the other is, I don't want you to lower your prices. In fact, you know what I really would like for you to do? raise your prices, raise your prices. Here's why. None of us wants to be in a commodity. We all want to sell value. Let Walmart be in the commodity business. Everybody that's a part of this, we all sell value, products, services, all that we provide and the, and the background. So I hope I've gotten everybody's attention that what happens in a recession, you know what your competition is doing? They're lowering their prices. They're getting defensive. And I want you to be thinking to be aggressive. And the other component that I'd like to get out there is that uh, in prospecting, we have something that's called CARE, Keep, Attain, Recapture, Expand. So K-A-R-E. So there's another insight that I would like everybody to be thinking about. And that is, and that is this, is that we lose more business over stroke deprivation than a price increase. And here's what I mean by that. Now with the recession is the time for us to be reaching out to our best customers. Now, here's what I know. You get an email, you get a phone call, you're going to call and return a call. None of us needs to be coached on that. What I'm saying is, that you are initiating phone calls to your best client customer relationships before they call you. And here's what I would like for you to do. Number one, it's like Gary Sure, Thank you. Thanks for being a great customer. Thanks for being a great client. And so I appreciate all the business that you've been able to give us. So that's number one. Second part of this is, hey, you know, no one's perfect, certainly not us. I'd like to ask you, what could we do better than what we're doing right now? See, that's a very vulnerable question. And I know a team, all of us are busy. We really are. But I want you to think about it. if you got today a call from someone, one of your, you know, one of your vendors that you've got a special relationship. They're a strategic alliance and, and uh, they're not just on price. But if they called you with those, with, with those kind of questions, hey, thanks for your business. I just want to know, how could we do a better job and be open and receptive? One of my favorite lines is, what's the four letter word that causes more businesses to go out of business than any other word? And the word, the four letter word is fine. F-I-N-E. Yeah, Jackie, you're ready for that. I could tell. So, and what that means is the worst thing that someone could hear, if, if, if the manager came over and said to a, uh, to a guest, how was your meal tonight, sir, ma'am? And they said, they replied, hey, it was fine. That is the worst 
thing. Now, a trained manager would say, appreciate you saying that. Sounds like we could have done something better. Now, what we have to be on the watch for is when someone says, well, no, no, everything was okay. Now, come, you've got to dig deeper. Seriously, what is it that we could do to better serve you? Is it something on the, is it something on the customer service side? Is it something on the quality side? Now, again, you're open up to be vulnerable, but think about that vulnerability leads to a lot of trust. And that's what we all are, uh, are wanting for. So Gary, those are my initial thoughts there. You probably have a follow-up question there. So yeah, I, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll because I think it's interesting. Last week, one of the, the interesting questions that we asked was, is your business or is your industry recession proof? And four of 11 respondents said, yes, it is recession proof. I'm like, what is it? Because that might be a good investing move because we had Ben McDonald on talking about investments and like what, like, money saving moves what what should you be doing with your money and if you weren't here last week go to the bgw youtube channel bgw cpa youtube channel and watch it because he took some very complex systems and theories and protocols and made them very simple to understand so anyway what what was interesting is four people and two people answered and joe was actually one of those cash automation which that's interesting Another one was uh, they had a high-end uh, hair salon. Yeah, hair keeps growing unless you got head like me. Uh, it, it grows, but it's not on my head. It's in my ears. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> it's, that's a very bad thing for men. I don't know what the deal is, but I have to be very careful on my ear grooming. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. This is interesting. There are three questions. Answer it. And here we go. All right. First question. Do you have a unified sales process in your company? So everybody's following the same process. Yes, no, or if we do, we're not following it. So and go ahead and answer if you guys would. Uh, scale of one to five, how do you hold your sales team accountable to right behaviors and results. You got- Hey Gary, can I, can I drop back to that first one there just for a second, yeah. please? Uh, you know, for those of you who are leaders, one of the, one, a great exercise you can do. So don't be so quick to say, yes, we are. Uh, it's really kind of interesting. If you asked your sales team, whether it was two people or maybe even it was one person because you know what your sales process is, is the leader. Ask them to uh, write down what your sales process is. I promise you, you're going to get different responses. If you were all and every, if there were six uh, steps and everybody was unified, I would be shocked. I would add something to what Jack wants to give away. I think I'd give a grand giveaway today too. <laughs> oh, there's the throwdown on the gift uh, incentives. I like that. Competition is always a good thing, isn't it, Jim? Yeah. All right. Come on, guys. Even if you're not in sales, and I'm assuming most of y'all are not, I know that there's some CEOs on this call and there's some people that are in management level positions. Take a swag, you know, yes. just give us, if you think, even if you're not in the sales world, that's cool. Do you think that your your company has one? And if so, I'd be curious as to how would you know? You know, is everybody doing the same thing or people doing different things? So, um, yep. And, and listen, people that say no, thank you for being honest. <laughs> because yep. thank you for being honest. Because, Jim, you probably have a lot of data <laughs> to back up on how many people say they do but really don't you That's know right. like if you and how you peel back the onion to determine that i think that would be very interesting to find out too so uh thank you for those who have voted so far i appreciate that keep rocking and rolling and while you're still voting the second question is 
How do you hold your sales team accountable to the right behaviors and results and multiple choices? Five out of five. Yep. We should be teaching others how to do it. We're that good Four, you know, not perfect, but doing pretty doggone well. Three kind of middle of the road one. We absolutely stink at it. All right. So, um, no, no, we stink at it at that, this point. That's great. Um, let's see what the heck. What's your top reason for your sales team uh, that the sales team isn't getting the results you want? Um, price. I can't remove the incumbent. No differentiation between us and competition. Interesting point that Jim made on the front end of this thing. We get a lot of let us think it over non -com non commits from uh, prospects. You know, that's one of the things here in the South. We have a lot of very polite people. For the most part, not everybody, <laughs> but yeah, you know, so just wait in line somewhere and then you'll see those that, that are not. Um, but well, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you very much. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean what we hope it would mean. Recession fears and prospects are delaying process purchases. Yeah, we've seen that. So, um, all right, I'm last call. Um, six of the 11 of you guys that are available have voted and i have no idea why this there's an untitled question that's multiple choice <laughs> that has choice one <laughs> that's funny five of the six have voted for choice one which who knows what it is but good you pick if you're not first you're last all right um <laughs> six or seven voted for that that's hilarious all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close out the poll and I'm gonna go ahead and publish the results. Here we go. Here are the results. Can you all see that all right? Yes. All right. So a lot of people think that they've got a unified sales process in your company. So Jim, you can deal with that. Uh, we have a lot of kind of middle of the road. So probably some room for improvement on holding teams accountable. I'd be curious if you guys want to hit us in the chat, those that you think that you're doing a good job on holding account people accountable, hit us up, um, be curious and we'll read your, your things there. And then price was, and recession fears were the lowest of the options. Can't remove the incumbent. So Jim, you might want to focus a little bit on that one. Um, because that's a real issue. I've been there more than once, y'all. Um, and so, all right, a couple questions that have come in before we go into that, Jim. So Derek says, how does this recession feel like to you? And in what ways, if any, will you approach this one differently than in previous downturns? And, and um, so, Jim, I think that'd be a good one for you. I'd like to hear Jack some of your thoughts on that too. And then uh, Joe, you always ask great questions. Uh, are you a fan of Marcus Sheridan's philosophy? They ask, you answer specific, uh, specifically about pricing. So Jim, that's a, another really targeted question for you. Okay. Well, let's take, let's take one at a time. What I'd like to do is, um, First of all, let me let me attack the, the question of how am I going to look at this recession any differently than uh, than the other? So uh, and then I'd like to come back to the uh, to number one, because I'm going to disagree with the results. I don't think it's the number that you have put down and I'll, I'll give you some evidence behind that. So uh, let's let's go back, uh, folks. Uh, to uh, to 2020, March of 2020, COVID. Um, we all, everybody, stay home, stay home. And uh, there was this fear. There was this anxiety. And uh, the, the problem with recessions is it creates a little bit of, of anxiousness. It creates uh, fear. Will I, you know, be able, how much business am I going to lose and all the other? And I got to tell you, so many of my clients initially reacted with fear. And later on, they said it was the best year that they had ever had. 
It was, it was absolutely amazing uh, because the whole idea is we continue to do behavior. So what am I going to do different? Nothing different than what I'm doing right now. I stay focused. You know, it's really interesting. I'm reading the book, Good to Great Again. And uh, although the companies have changed, the philosophy by Jim Collins doesn't change. And he talks about this flywheel concept. And in there, he's got these principles. Uh, and number one is disciplined people. And disciplined people means is that my sales team, anyone who's business development is going out there and they are developing and cultivating those relationships. So disciplined people is number one. Number two is disciplined thought. Stay with creating value. Don't discount your price, even though someone might be saying, well, you guys are higher. There's ways of, of working through that rather than uh, asking a dumb question like, how high are we? And the third principle going back to Jim Collins is disciplined action. So disciplined people, disciplined thought, disciplined action. I continue to do the behaviors that I will become successful. You know, there's something that's called the success triangle. Picture a triangle, draw a triangle, success triangle, three points up at the top is attitude. So how is our attitude affected by the recession? Well, here's, here's how we're motivated. We are either, we are either fear motivated or we're hope motivated. We are moving towards what we want or away. So on the bottom left-hand side of the success triangle is behavior. We do, the, you know what the three metrics are, the three activities that lead you to your greatest results. Meaningful conversations, number of new meetings, number of new closed deals, whatever those metrics are for you that you and your team stay consistent. And T is technique. What's technique? How I say what I need to say, what I, what I do. So it's those three in compass. Okay, so I don't know if there's a follow-up there. I'm not going to do anything different with, with the supposed recession. And then again, we all know what a, what a recession is. Some companies do really well with recessions. Some are affected more so than others. You've got to look at your industry. How have I been affected by recessions in the past? Um, Gary, I'm going to go on to that, uh, to that first question there. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. I apologize, but yeah. So I don't know if anybody wants me to comment anymore on the question of how am I going to look at this recession any, any different? Hey, so I'd like to add one thing to that that reemphasizes a couple points that you made. I was brought in to do my first turnaround in 1991. 90, 90, 91. Well, if you remember right, that was about the time when, um, yeah, I was 91, when Project uh, Desert Storm hit. So we invaded, you know, Iraq, blah, 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 uh, did that. Well, 1991 was a crappy year. I mean, it was a tough year. Jim, you said you launched in 92, right? 92. So, um, we, I was brought into a company that was basically bankrupt. They, he didn't even have the money to go bankrupt. And so we were in this big shootout with three other much, much bigger ad agencies. We came in number two, pays the same as last. But what that said was, wow, we beat out these other two really big ones. So we hunkered down, went to our existing client base. We got rid of hourly pricing and we went based on project pricing and we priced it at the high end of the market we were just small i mean everybody quit except for me and my partner so it was just him and me <laughs> so we we went from like an eight person shop to to two uh when we had to take pay cuts to keep the doors open well guess what and we, we said we're going to give we're going to price it high but we're going to kill them in service we're going to give them a great product 
not nickel and diamond, which ad agencies are really good about like, oh, change fee, change fee, change fee, change fee. We, we buttoned things up on the front end, had a, you know, a better process. We turned that company into the black in less than nine months. Huh. In a reception, you know, things were yeah. tough out there. People were letting yeah. people go and people quit our place. We didn't have, but we went from massive red, like our shirts, to black really quickly because of those things. And raising our prices, that was terrifying to do. Yes. But I thought, man, let's give them something that their, their money, that they can't get in everywhere else. And you talk yeah. a lot about pain. And the pain is in that world, change fees, you know, yeah. um, I'm, I'm going to, spend, a, I think I'm going to spend this much, but I end up spending that much. And then I don't know what my results are going to be, all that kind of stuff. So we addressed that kind of stuff and we went out of the hourly pricing. So all of the stuff that you said, differentiate, raise your prices. That sounds good in theory. It's terrifying to do, but it actually, I'm living proof that it, it, it actually worked. Yeah. So uh, great points on that one. So Derek, hopefully, um, you know, Jack, before we move on from that question, do, I'm curious, how does this recession feel like to you differently than 08, 09 in particular? We saw it in the, I mean, gosh, we saw it in the 80s. We saw it in 2000, 2001, especially after 9-11. Talk to us. You know, like, I, I'd like you to answer that one, too. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so I, you know, I don't, I've been thinking about this, and so the psychology behind it. And I don't know if it was because we were so stung the last time that we just have become, um, I didn't want to say cynical, I want to say maybe more conservative uh, and have been more resilient. So the ability to, and I was like for an example, someone who maybe really wasn't in contact with their financial advisor uh, prior to the last one has, you know, maintained contact with a financial or maybe even gotten a financial advisor so that when things like this happen, they can not be so surprised or that they can react sooner than they have than they did previously. So they aren't completely wiped out. So I think there's the psychology is a, a somewhat suspicion, not paranoia, but I think more preparedness. And I think that um, people have seen that, okay, we can get through it. And the ones that adapt to things like you said, that are counterintuitive, which is raise prices instead of lower prices, or say, okay, let's make this investment, even though it's gonna be painful for a little while, but we, we kind of think we, we see where we're gonna end up 18 months from now, potentially two years from now. Um, the kind of the reactivity of the government, like so for example, today, earlier today when we were talking about, okay, why all of a sudden were the uh, Senate Democrats or just Congress in general, they were like this, and then you have the Fed doing something, and, and it could be, it's obviously interrelated, but did one cause the other? So you have these things that maybe weren't occurring back then as being forces that are working against each other and eventually have to come out through a certain shoot. So I think all those things kind of put together, but I think that we're, we're, we're paying attention more um, and have done things in the past decade or so that have put us in a better position to um, get through this. Uh, and, and there's even discussion as to whether or not we really are in a recession or not. And you know, right. is it okay, well, because uh, GDP and, and everything else is, is down, but there's still job creation. So, you know, it depends on who you talk to. Are we, do we have a problem or do we not have a problem with, uh, with um, you know, monetary policy and everything else? So just some general thoughts. So, um, Joe, we're not, we're, we're going to leap frog over your question. Are you a fan of Marcus Sheridan's philosophy? They ask you answer. Jim will answer that specifically about pricing, but um, Bruce brought, brought, brings up a really interesting series of questions. Some past recessions equal good time 
to offer retirement options to reduce the number of layoffs and move uh, and to move demographics to get to get the the workforce younger. This recession, aren't there employees or employers who can't afford to lose any employees? Can we assume that COVID may have pushed many employees to retirement who were on the fence? Overall question is, is will this financial period change the demographics of the workforce? Man, that is some, those are some really insightful thoughts as well as some good questions, Bruce. Anyone want to jump in on that one? I, I Sure. So my thoughts on that are a couple things. I mean, you have forces that are working against employers and that the Bruce your question is multifaceted because you have first of all and, and we are all seeing it which is a younger generation with expectations not requests meaning working from home working less hours um, being more accommodated to certain things and so you have that you know it's normally you'd say okay fine if the older generation wants out we have a pool of younger people and they would be honored to work for us and with us, right? That's not the case anymore. Um, and so we, we, and we've talked about how do you find creative ways and incentives to bring people into the work for force uh, at younger, in, in the younger generations. Yes, I think it, I, from, I see that the older generations are maybe um, retiring earlier but I also see that they're retiring later than they wanted to because they were holding on. So you have, it's, it's kind of bipolar where you have older individuals that are like, I, I gotta stay, I got, I'm, this is my baby, I can't let it go and I have to stay, but I should have retired. I thought I was gonna be on a beach hanging out drinking margaritas, you know, so, but, and it didn't happen. But then you have others who, for whatever reason, it is like, okay, well, I just, I can't do this anymore because of the additional stress that has brought upon me health. I mean, actual physical health issues that maybe COVID has impacted them. Um, there's also the psychology behind it when you see uh, your maybe some friends who didn't make it in, in, in particular in that older demographic. So you see people that are like, OK, these people died younger than they should have on average. And so. I'm going to you know, modify my lifestyle so that I can go hang out with my grandkids more and kind of thing. So you have all these forces and I, I, I haven't been able to really identify and say this is the leading force behind early retirements uh, or things like that. So I, I think it's multi forces and it, it depends on industry. It depends on, um, you know, what is goods and services, goods or services. So there's just so many variables that go into that. But I think that general statement is, is that yes, a uh, general answer is that yes, uh, do you see um, higher level of retirements, um, but it's a mixture of past due retirements and then maybe some early retirements mixed in with kind of normal course retirements. Just curious, because I'm kind of running the uh, the polls and all that kind of stuff. On your screen, does the poll take up the entire screen? Does it, uh, is it in a little window that you can move around? I'm just curious, <laughs> humor me. Somebody hit me on the chat and let me know what you see. <laughs> that would be Mary, it, looks, it looks like it. I mean, it's like a normal window so you can maximize or minimize it. So I have- Okay, a cool. Thanks nice. to the, yeah. Very cool. That's that's what I see. I can do that, but I didn't know if that was the thing. So Andrew weighed in. Uh, great point by Bruce. What do you see companies doing about knowledge transfer? Ooh. Yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting question, too, because we also just in our law firm have that issue. So I'll give you an example. So there is a 15 year gap between me and my next senior partners. So, you know, 50 to 65. And um, those guys aren't going to go, well, I shouldn't say that. Some of them are ready to be done. Some of them, they will go on until someone kicks them out because they are, that's just the way they are. They're energetic and they're knowledgeable and they just, you know. Uh, and so, um, but it's like, what do you do with that knowledge base, that institutional knowledge, the skill set? And so, and, and then you're like, okay, well, you got to train the younger generation. 
Well, now you have a younger generation that is somewhat nomadic, more nomadic than they have been in the past. And so, you know, and that happened to me that had, uh, had been training a young associate, uh, and this was a couple of years ago, and then they moved to Raleigh because got married, having a kid, they wanted to be closer to grandparents and that's where the grandparents were. So things that are out of my control. Uh, but it, it's an example of, you ha I think you have to have a planned knowledge transfer down the line. So have your Padawans, have your apprentices have, uh, and, and get that knowledge transferred to the extent it can be. But also I think that in this day and age where you have tools like databases you have so we have a whole training section on our intra or um intra web our internal website that you can go to and it's okay here's the training on this here's the training on outlook here's training on this here's you know so all these things so preserve knowledge too and i think companies are doing a better job of that rather than saying you're the hr person you need to know everything and now go train these group of of newbies that just came in kind of thing. So, I mean, that's my perspective on that. But yeah, knowledge transfer is, is an issue. Um, and I think it's been exacerbated by the fact that you have more people that are ready to go who have that knowledge. And so how do you preserve that? And you have to have ready, willing and able participants too, right? And so if you have people who are like, okay, not my problem that you didn't train that you didn't train those people. Yeah, and so you have to have a culture of mentorship, I think, within the organization as well. That's a good point. We're investing heavily in that, Bruce and, and Andrew. Um, and we're, we're kind of bifurcating it at BGW. One is we're continuing on and pushing even more people into the Sandler training system, which is a system so that we're all speaking the same language going through Jim as the coach. And then we, we've had a, a very big repository. And if you're a client of BGW, you, you've hopefully been to the vault, but it's just a wash in information and it's our best stuff. But just like the library over here in South Park, I don't go to the library all that often. So there's a wealth of information that's at my fingertips if I just drive over there and go in or go online. Not everybody does that. So we're taking a mentorship program to a higher level and we've got an outside trainer that specifically focuses on uh, accounting firms and taking our stuff in our library and taking our next generation and even our current generation of quarterbacks, so they're all CPAs, and leadership team like myself, who's not a CPA, uh, through that so that we're in one accord and we do have some of that knowledge transfer going on. But it's an investment. But then now's, a, now's the time to invest in, in that kind of stuff, it seems like. And the people that I've seen that made those investments, if you go back to Roddy Players, uh, episode on the anything but typical podcast uh, from that we launched a couple of weeks ago when they saw COVID coming in they invested heavily in stocking up and finding more warehouse space because they had a feeling supply chain was going to uh, be an issue it paid off in huge dividends they used a lot of that EIDL money PPP money stuff that launched this webinar <laughs> 122 weeks ago uh, they use that money to build up their uh, war chest based on that pivot and doing something different like what Jim said earlier. So Jim, you got the microphone again, some good questions, good interaction here. Um, but let's go back into, all right, so what do you do with some of these things that uh, you know people have answered here on these yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Gary. And there really, is, uh, there's some fantastic conversation here going on. And uh, I'm going to get to Joe's uh, question too with uh, with Marcus Sheridan. But let's first do an exercise because you won't believe me. You, you're going to believe your data and not mine. Uh, and and so uh, let's do an exercise with no, with number one. So here's the way to take a look at number one. If 
I have a unified sales process and it's working, your closing ratio should be 70% or greater. Let me say that again. If your current sales process, so I'm not going to argue yes or no, we're, 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 we're going to do some proof here. So if your sales, if, you're, if, if everybody is doing a, a single sales process, closing ratio 70% or greater. All right. Now, uh, and that is quotes to deals. You send out a quote. Uh, no matter whether it's somebody's asking for a price or uh, you're working through engineering or uh, there's a lot of consultative type of, uh, of selling and what you're doing, 70% or greater. So if that's not your case, one of two things is happening. And I'll give you and I'll give you some facts behind this. One, your team is not working your sales process. So, or your, or really more importantly, your current sales process isn't working. Your current sales process, because it should be 70% or greater. So if it's not, then okay, but yet my team is doing it, then I would, I would say pattern interrupt, going into a recession, we need to refine, we need to re-up our sales process. Sales process, meaning how a lead is generated, hand it to a salesperson, or a salesperson makes a cold call or a referral call. All right, here's the other thing about it. So the other part of it is, is that uh, your team is not using that sales process. Let's talk a little bit about that. There's a company out there called Gong, G-O-N-G. -G. What is Gong? Gong does a lot of work with, uh, with Salesforce. Here's what they do. They record sales conversations. And here's what they found out. This is amazing. So companies that are really drilling in on, on training, 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 unified sales process, the facts came out that less than 30% of the entire sales team, whether it was hundreds of people or uh, smaller companies, less than 30% of the sales people were actually using the sales process. So my question is, unless you're hearing your people on that sales call, how do you really know? Well, you would know if you, number one, if you heard them or if you had the ability to listen to some of their calls, or secondly, that your, 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 your quote to, uh, uh, to success ratio was 70% or greater. Thoughts on that, team? Anybody have some thoughts on that? Well, what's, what's interesting, too, a variation I was thinking, you know, Gary, when you put that question up there was, you know, it's, and, and the third response was, if we do, we're not following it. I think that is that we're following part of it. Part of and it. Yep. The, the reason why I say that is I'm thinking about, it. so I was at an event last night and obviously exchanging business cards. And then, so I have a process of what I do with those business cards, as far as, you know, getting LinkedIn on with them and, and those kind of things that I do, but I'm thinking, okay. And, and um, before I went on this vacation, went to an event and those business cards are still sitting on my desk at work and I haven't done anything with them. And so in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, so my, I'm not implementing my own process and, you know, have I, I, I don't think I've done huge detriment to my conversion. I think that, but, but it'd be very easy to say, okay, you know, we're not going to do, um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll do that later. A variation of that is that if, if someone is following their sales process, so I go, I go to an event and I, I, use this word lightly, but I harvest business cards and then I'm going to do something with them. Um, if I'm just doing that mechanically, but then I don't do anything after that. Like I don't follow up right. with those leads because, you know, I think most people on the, this the call is like, okay, it's not going to happen after the first time, second time, unless you're very lucky. So it takes right. multiple times. So, you know, do these things go into this vacuum and you are following the process, you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, but if you don't do that ninth and 10th step of the process, so you've gotten eight tenths of the way through it, but really if you don't do nine and 10, 
your ratio that 70% is going to end up being 30 that's to 40%, it. I would think, right? That's it. That's it. And then what, what's that costing you? Really great points there, Jack. Excellent. So let's go to point number two, because I want to end with, with Joe's uh, question and, and we can talk a little bit about why we're not getting the business. So regarding uh, accountability, um, so most of the responses were three and four. Uh, here, so my question to each one of you that did that, and thank you for your responses there, is what is it costing you by not really holding your people accountable? Because now we're headed to, or we're, we're thinking about, we've been talking about recession here. More than at any time, here's the strategy that we need to promote. And this will work for everyone. I want you to look at, at how you look at, look at your, your territory, your geography, your customers, your clients. And what I'd like for you to create is, uh, again, this care model, keep, attain, recapture, expand. I can't think of a better time when we need to hold people accountable to how many keep calls or touch calls do we need to be making on a weekly basis to our top customers, whether they're hearing from us or not? Attain. What behaviors, in other words, new behaviors to attain new business right now is when we need to be going after that new business. So what do I mean by that? Here's what you can track. Let's not number of cold calls and all that calls. Everybody knows that. Here's what's most important. Meaningful conversations, MC, meaningful conversations. And what that means is with a decision maker who has the ability to invite you in to talk further about your sales process. So meaningful conversations and new appointments. See, what happens is we get comfortable. We call on our best customers. Now we need to be attaining new business so we can go after number three, which I'll, we'll end, we'll, we've got a little bit of time here. How do you remove an incumbent? So my structure needs to be on what, what behaviors for new business. Now next, which I think is an incredible opportunity, recapture. Who said no to me six months ago, a year, a year ago? Those recapture, I've been doing what I've been doing for 30 years. I could go out and I could talk, pick up the phone to Joe Farrell. In fact, I think I will. Hey, Joe, how are you? What's going on? Recapture, recapture that relationship. Uh, and so you never know. Maybe him and Sean are like, hey, maybe we need to talk to Jim again. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. And lastly is expand. Where can we expand new services, new products? How can we expand our line, upsell our line? So that's the strategy that we need to be thinking about. So I need to hold my team accountable to their care model, one or two activities with each. You'll be amazed if you're able to do that. And by the way, here's the best way of holding your people accountable. And because we, now we find out, okay, well, how can we do that? It's just really a real simple question. So if, if you do not do those behaviors, let's just make it real easy. If you were me in my shoes, what would you do? If you were me in my shoes, what would you do? You know what? You're, it, that's an amazing question. And I find sometimes salespeople are harder on themselves than you might be with them. Any comments? If not, I want to hit uh, the, the incumbent and the Marcus Sheridan comment, Gary. So, so we got about six minutes left. What do we do? Yeah, go for it. Okay. All right. Uh, Joe asked, do I know Marcus Sheridan? No, I don't. That's the truth. So I don't know what his price strategy is. So I can tell you this, if we are hearing something that your price is too high, there's one simple response. And the response is, because I'm looking at Jack here, hey, Jack, I appreciate your honesty, honesty with me. Not unusual. We typically are highest price. My question is, you're, you're obviously telling me that for a reason. Can you help me? 
It's real simple and it works. You know what starts to happen? They answer. They answer. See, I need to know more information. And I tell you what, if we're getting any problems on price, here's our problem. We haven't done a very good job selling value. So how do you remove an incumbent? Here's how you remove an incumbent. Is that if they will agree to see you, you must understand the following three points. Number one, what are the top three challenges or concerns that affects them today and in their business? And how does your product relay over to that? That's number one. So we need to understand what they are and, and, and get the prospect to admit, yeah, that's an issue. That is a problem. Number two, I need to find out the reasons behind those problems. More and better questions so that I can learn more. What do I mean by that? Impact. What's it costing? And thirdly, and I'll give you a great story. And this is how I even began working with BGW. The number one problem that accounting firms have is removing an incumbent. Or when they're trying, they're an accounting firm trying to get in to a, to a new to new business because we all know that's really hard. So here's a question that I trained Adam on, and here's what he started asking. And the question was, after doing the first two steps well, of him saying, you know, hey, here's going to be your biggest concern, moving away from your present CPA company. That's going to be your really biggest concern. So may as well deal with the truth. So my question to you is that. If you felt like we could help you, and we don't know that yet, but we're going to work through that. But if you, if, we, if you felt like we could help you, would you be willing to change? And that conversation right there changed everything. So folks, when removing an incumbent, we got to get in the door first. That's another strategy that we don't have time for. But when you are... Those are the following three steps that you need to follow through with. And with that, Gary, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Thanks. All right. Well, this is our prospect qualification checklist, and it follows a baseball diamond. Yep. And to Jack's point, just because you have it doesn't mean you use it or you consistently use it. And that is true in our shop too. Yep. And it's yep. true with me. <laughs> so that's why Jim is still our coach after eight years. We're slow learners. <laughs> we need accountability. And it doesn't mean, you know, knuckles being wrapped by a ruler by Sister Mary Clarence. <laughs> it is, it means holding each other accountable and that can be fun we we do fun stuff at times and you know uh the care model uh, actually sandler has this app that's really cool and it kind of measures your activity because leading indicators are your activity lagging indicators are your results a lot of times we look at results yeah but we fail to look at our leading indicators what's our input so we've learned a lot of stuff from uh, Jim. We're going to have him back again because this is, you know, increasing top line is a huge issue in every company, even whether you got a sales process or not, it's a huge issue. And that's why we're addressing it now. We'll bring it back and bring in Jim. And if you are a client of ours, we have, um, if you're a business client of BGWs, every quarter, he does uh, a half day session and we don't charge for it. If you're a BGW uh, business client, sit in on it. I've sat in on all of them that he's been doing. Plus every year he does the, the greatest year ever, best year ever planning. And it, like, it's so, it's, it's so cool. I have all of mine <laughs> from every year and it's, it's so cool to see. So anyway, Jim, thank you for taking time. Um, you know, we're, we're pushing up against the hour. And I know that Jack said at the beginning of this thing, hey, if anybody waits to the end, um, you've got some prizes. So Jack, you know, can you tell us what these I, prizes are? I do. Well, I mean, they're, I, they're 
uh, gift cards to, to Starbucks, but I might up the ante. So two random questions from my uh, adventures from last week. The first person who tells me what is the usual time, timer, time amount on the waffle makers at Mar most Marriott's and Holiday Inns, <laughs> then I will give you a, a coffee gift certificate because it's the same time anywhere you go, regardless, it's the same machines, it's the ones you flip. So first person to tell me that, so that's the first question. Um, no. That's what I would have so. guessed, Joe. Higher. I would have um, guessed one minute. <laughs> and uh, the second question is, in Antelope Canyon, which Indian tribe is the predominant tribe? In Antelope Canyon, which is in, well, this may give it away, in, in uh, Arizona. <laughs> and if nobody knows, I can say, uh, you know, we'll, we'll. Navajo. Yes. So yes, Andrew, cool. Andrew. And he had some really great questions today. So I think it's appropriate. Okay. So should I save my waffle question for the next time? Throw it out there. Yeah, because nobody got it. And uh, now, now people are going to run by. Seconds. <laughs> that's right. Well, now people are going to run by the Holiday Inn near their house <laughs> in the morning and go look at the waffle makers, right? Which is fine. Yeah, that that sounds like a, a great deal. Um, Andrew, uh, I think we've got your contact information. I'll just double check here real quick. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll have it. I'll get I'll get your email to Jack. And good job. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for great questions, great interactivity today. We'll plan on being back next week. We'll still talk about recession proofing your business and what does this latest uh, machination of Washington wildness mean for you and us, you know? So thank you guys. We'll put this up on the BGW CPA channel later on this afternoon. You guys have thank a great you. day and a great rest of the week. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Jim and Jack, good to have you back. All yes. right, see y'all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.